All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week, we're back to building the G Made GOM. Last time, we just unpacked the steering servo, ready to start step 47. When we fitted the shift servo, we had to use a couple of plastic servo spacers. For the steering, we used two more of the same. This time, though, the manual shows that we need the top of the splines to be three or four millimeters from the bottom of the electronics tray. This will be based on the plastic servo arm that we're going to fit later. If we end up changing to a metal arm, there's a good chance we're going to have to fiddle with the mounting to get it all lined up. To fit the servo to the tray, we need four M3 by 15 cap heads. There's nothing special to the fitment, it's just one screw per corner. Do them up so the servo's nice and solid on the tray. Step 48, the receiver box lid, and this one opens quite the can of worms. Right, we need the lid of course, four M3 by 15 countersunk screws, the ESC, which is a Hobbywing WP1080. For now, all we need from the box is the ESC itself. We'll come back to the programming card a little bit later. And we're going to need a receiver. This is a FlySky 6 channel. With a very minor tweak to the case, it'll fit very snugly in the box. The problem is where the antenna comes out of the end. It makes it just a millimetre or so too long. To make it fit, we need to open the case up. Now it's held together with just four very small screws, so they need to come out. Now we can remove the board and put it somewhere safe. Now we could just wrap it in some electrical tape, but I think I'd rather use the case. All we need to do is trim that little nub off the end and make a slot so we can run the antenna out of the top rather than the end. The plastic's so thin it only takes a couple of touches with a Dremel. When we put it back together, with the antenna coming out of the top, we've got a radio that's a perfect fit in the box, almost designed for it. Next, we need to connect up the steering servo and ESC and shift servo to the receiver. Steering in channel 1, ESC channel 2 and the shifter to channel 3. The fun bit next, we need to stuff all the excess servo wire into the box along with the receiver. Sounds easy, but it does have a tendency to try and spring out. Hold them all down while sliding the lid into position, being extremely careful not to trap any of the wires, especially the antenna. There's a small gap at one end for the wires to come out of. It's only just big enough, so it would be very easy to pinch one. It's considerably easier to do if you remove the electronics tray from the chassis rail. It's only the two screws that we fitted in step 46, and it gives us far better access and visibility. When fitting the four countersunk screws to keep the lid on, keep a very close eye on the wires. As long as you hold the lid nice and tight, they shouldn't move, but it's always better to be safe than pinch one. We can stick the ESC to the lid next. I'm sure the GOM kit has some servo tape somewhere in one of the bags, but so does the ESC, which is much easier to get at. Plus, it's already pre-cut to size. There's the big bit for the ESC, and there's a small bit for the switch, which is very convenient. All we do is stick the tape to the bottom of the ESC and pop it down towards the rear of the lid. If you really want to make sure it's not going to fall off later, you can give the surfaces a very quick clean with some alcohol first, just to remove any grease and oil. We'll just leave the switch hanging for now, as we're going to need to stick it somewhere where we can actually get to the button when the rest of the cage is fitted. Before we get to the next bit, we'll just loosely refit the electronics tray in its proper position. We won't bother with the two screws yet, just in case we need to rejig something. Right, for the next bit of the install, we're going to need the soldering gun. Any large iron with a bit of grunt will do. This gun's 140 watts, which does make light work of the motor connections. The motor's been soldered to before, so I'm going to give it a little dab of flux on the terminals and flow a bit of fresh solder, just so the wires solder up with the least amount of fuss. Initially, we'll just quickly solder the two wires to the motor and not worry which one goes to which terminal. Now there's a little trick we can use to get the motor wires and the transmitter channel reverse all set the right way. If we look at the programmer, we've got running mode, which has a forward brake option. If we set the ESC to this mode, we'll easily be able to tell which way the ESC thinks it's going. Programming the ESC is very easy. All we do is connect up the programming card to the ESC's programming port. Connect a battery to the ESC and turn it on. The default is running mode with option 3. We need to change it to option 1, which is as simple as pressing the value button, then OK to save the change. Next, we can switch it all off again and disconnect the programmer. Turn on the transmitter and switch the ESC back on. 
Now, unfortunately, I didn't record this bit, but bear with me. If you pull the trigger and nothing happens, but pushing it away makes the motor spin, you need to reverse channel 2 on your transmitter. Next, if you pull the trigger and the output of the transfer box spins backwards, you need to swap the motor wires. This is easy to work out if you hold up one of the axles and spin the shaft to visualise which way it needs to spin. It would have been even easier if I'd actually recorded the actions, but there we go. In my case, the transmitter was set correctly, but the motor wires were reversed. I've already desoldered them and shortened the blue wire before noticing I wasn't actually recording. I've tried to route the wires so they're going to stay neat and tidy once the rest of the cage is fitted. With both the wires soldered, it all looks fairly tidy. All that's left to do is reset the ESC to forward brake reverse, which is option 3 for the running mode. When the truck's built, it should be ready to run straight away. There's still a lot of settings to play with, but it should drive with the current setup. The last thing to do is refit the two screws we removed from the side to reattach the electronics tray to the chassis rail. And there we go, that's step 48 done. Step 49 next, we're fitting the panel bar mount to the other chassis rail. As you might imagine, there's not much to this one. We need the other frame rail, the one that's not already on the chassis, and the small plastic bar mount. This is another good candidate for the aluminium upgrades, but we'll see how the stock one goes first. For screws, all we need is two M3x10 cap heads and a pair of M3 plain nuts. To fit the mount, we'll pop one of the screws in so we've got something to locate things with and pass it through the chassis rail. On the back, we've got a pair of hex-shaped holes for the nuts, but because they're plain nuts, we'll need a smear of thread lock on the end of the threads just to make sure the nuts can't come loose. As usual, we need to be extra careful we don't get any thread lock on the plastic. A little care with a cocktail stick and we can fit the nut. Same thing again with the other one and we've got ourselves a rather solid panhard bar mount. Step 50. Making the chassis look like a chassis. We're going to need the chassis rail we were just playing with and the rear brace which comes from this rather large bag of cage bits. It really is in there, it's just a bit tricky to spot. For fixings we've got quite a range. We've got two M3x15s three m 3 by 10s three m 3 by 18s two m 3 by 20s and two m 3 by 25s The only bit you need to watch out for on this one is getting the right screws in the right holes. There's a lot to choose from and there's a bit of overlapping on the diagram. It's probably best to fit all the ones that are nice and clear, then work through the ones that are left. We'll fit all the screws very loosely first, including the two screws that hold the brace. When all the screws are in and you're sure they're all in the right places, we can go around and do them up. For best results, do them up a turn or two at a time before moving on to the next. Not only does it involve building any stresses and twists into the frame, but it also keeps the screws from building up enough heat to soften the plastic. Step 51. The strap on the battery tray. We will of course need the tray, along with a pair of M3 washers, a pair of M3x6 dome heads, and a rather large o-ring. They actually give you two which is nice. It's one of those things that if you keep the model long enough will almost certainly perish. I'm talking over 10 years so a spare is good but if you can still find it after 10 years you'll be doing rather well. Putting it together is nice and straightforward. The o-ring sits in a couple of slots on the front bottom edge and the screws go in with the washers bridging the top of the slots keeping the o-ring in place. The important thing is not to over tighten the screws. They only just need to be bottomed out. There's absolutely no advantage to really nipping them up. If your washers are touching the plastic, the o-ring isn't going to go anywhere. Step 52. Um, nuts by the looks of it. We need four M3 nylocks for this one along with the battery tray. First job is to settle the o-ring with a gentle stretch and a tug. Then cross it over and slide it onto the two posts. You have to be a bit careful with it now as there's nothing keeping it from popping off. The nuts have recesses to drop into which sounds simple but they have a tendency to find every other orientation but the right one. All four should have the nylon bits towards the inside of the tray. If you really struggle a pair of nice fine tip tweezers can make life a little bit easier. Step 53 fitting the tray to the chassis. For this one we need four M3 by 15 cap heads. The battery tray slots in between a couple of mounting points on the chassis rail. 
And that's the easy part. The hard part is getting the screws to line up with the nuts. I fiddled for quite a while trying to do them up, but it was a bit of a struggle. I ended up finding the nuts drop just a little bit too low in their slots, meaning entry to the threads is partially blocked. I ended up holding the nuts with a pair of tweezers at just the right height to get them started, then did them all up after. This is the first bit of the kit that I think didn't quite go together perfectly, but it's still not bad. Now the tray's on, we can test fit one of these 2S hard case packs, and they're an absolutely perfect fit. The only issue might be the wires coming out of the top getting in the way, but we'll find out when we get the chassis put together fully. Step 54, assembling the front of the cage. We'll do this last one before we end the video, as it's going to tie all the front bits together so we can't lose anything. We're going to need the front of the cage and the front bumper. For screws, there's a few to find. We need two M3 by 20 cap heads, two M2.5 by 12 dome heads, and two M3 by 18 dome heads. The big bit sits just above the electronics and gets held on with two M3 by 20s. I did find them rather difficult to start the threads, so I beveled the edges a bit with a knife. You can do the same with a Phillips screwdriver, just a couple of twists is all you need just to take the corner off. Install the screws a few turns, leaving them with plenty of slack so the front cage can still move around quite freely. Flip the chassis over and install the bottom of the front bumper with the M3x18s. Again, it was a bit of a struggle to get the screws to bite, so I beveled the holes with a knife. Again, do them up a few turns, but leave it so the bumper is still able to move around. Next, we've got two M2.5 screws that tie the bumper to the front cage. These ones went in fairly easily, so no beveling was required. So now it's all loosely put together, we can go around and nip up all the screws. You need to be a bit careful with the M2.5s at the front, they would be very easy to strip the threads. And that's going to be it for this week. We've got a nice looking lump of RC that's starting to look a lot like a chassis. Next we've got the drive shafts to put together, which appear to involve an awful lot of Eclipse. And that's followed by fitting the axles, so that should be fun. As always, I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button. If you want to see what happens next, you can subscribe. And if you really want to make sure you don't miss anything, you can hit that little bell too. Bye guys!